be a question and answer type of show because we don't have a lot of time and we want to keep, I don't want to drag you over, but we want to keep um, to time but also want to make sure when you leave here that your time is very important to us. So we want to make sure that when you leave we're answering your questions. So if there are questions at any point of time, please um, let us answer those for you as we go through, if that makes sense. So are there any questions ar around the typical ways and means that people volunteer in that category? Please. There, there, yeah, there's a there's a process. Uh, there's a form you need to sign that Centrelink will give to her, um, and it depends on um, her capacity. The it starts off at 15 hours a week or 30 hours a fortnight, and again, some of that might suit the way the CDATs work. It's not you know necessarily a nine to five job, but um, she might have less hours that she has to do depending on um, her capacity to work. So basically, um, you sign that form. You commit to it's usually a year. Uh, of supporting that person to be involved in your CDAP. And that's what we'd call formal volunteering. Um, and then um, employee volunteering is probably a lot of you here who might, as part of your role um, with health or a youth service or whatever, be part of the CDAP. So your organisation is volunteering you to be part of that. Um, spontaneous volunteering, I'm sure a lot of you get that as well. You're putting on a um, skate comp or something and someone jumps on the barbie and helps out. So they're not a formal volunteer but they're coming and giving you a hand on the day. And then the informal volunteering is more about, you know, um, su supporting people in your neighbourhood and, and friends and family, that kind of thing. As an organisation, you also need to fill out a form yourself. And uh, I think if I remember, it, I think it's a, an AD1762 form. Um, for those that are in the Newcastle Central Coast, email that form to you. Um, and it, it's, it's the opposite side of the volunteers. So you've got to be an approved organisation that Centrelink accepts. You've got to have volunteer insurance, all those type, of, those mechanical processes. And then, uh, sorry, and, and then, so when, when they go to you in the form and you fill the form out, it then doesn't go to Centrelink and the, and the beautiful database that Centrelink says doesn't exist. So but, uh, between the pair of us, we'll be able to help you. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the things to add here as well is that ADF actually has the volunteer insurance for all CDAP members. So that's where you access that. Automatically covered. To, yeah, that's automatically great. covered by that. Okay, so many different people um, volunteer. We certainly have noticed there's a lot um, a greater diversity at the moment. A lot of young people, <coughs> which, um, particularly between 14 and 18, are looking to volunteer, sometimes as part of their um, schoolwork, sometimes just because they want to be more involved in their community. A lot of people also looking for work-related experience um, or because of um, Centrelink obligations, work-related um, pathways to employment. And the other thing too as we go, is that what we can't um, uh, undervalue is people connect with the role, but they really connect with the philosophical view of the organisation. So when we, when one of the things we get into is when we talk about role descriptions is that you, you really need to incorporate that into your description because people harmonise with that stance the organisation takes. So it's not always about the duties and those, but where the organisation's standing. So it's always a good thing to put in your promotional um, language. I was going to do a bit of a, um, an activity here. I think we'll wait till the end and see if we've got any time left to do this where you can um, share your stories about the volunteers that you have. So benefits of gaining volunteers, but the CDATs you can gain, you can gain a greater level of service, you can do more for less. And I think more with um, CDEX is actually about invol <coughs> excuse me, involving your community and sharing the word and, and the ideas that you have in a way of, sort of reducing harm. Uh, I know certainly the CDEX I was involved in, that was the most powerful way of um, getting our message across was to involve community members in everything that we did. And it, and it helps you promote your events. Word of mouth is the best way of getting advertising out for any event. Yeah, and, and you really do. Through those activities, you're actually... You're really not um, engaging with volunteers. What you're trying to do is, is grow ambassadors because that's the next phase in any volunteer growth is that they, they come into you as individuals, they become volunteers. But as they, you know, are part of that 
that, that attraction, that retention, that recognition is they then become ambassadors. And, you know, you, you can't beat people that, you know, have the passion, have the wisdom, have the guidance, but also have the loyalty that promote what you're trying to do. So please never let a person remain just a volunteer. You know, if, if we, you know, we, we support them, we recognise, we, we, we develop them, they actually become our ambassadors within the community of which we operate in. And that leads nicely on to retaining volunteers. Oh, such a good segue, <laughs> wasn't it? Such a good segue. So what do you think the benefits of volunteering with CDATS can be for your volunteers? Is there anything that those of you already have volunteers um, that other than, than because Centrelink's asked them to do some volunteering? Are there other things that people enjoy about volunteering for your CDATS? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the young lady up. Yeah. I saw her hand go up first, oh, so... Yeah. Now your voice is it's very soft <laughs> and we're such a long way away and you have such a pretty smile. So do you want to say that again? And, and I think it's a great move because the, the best way to promote a vo volunteering opportunity or what you do is actually that here's one we've prepared early. It's a bit like a cooking show. And you have those peer educators up giving a great insight and expanding what they do. So it, it's a bit like for like. So I think it's a clever move. Well done. But uh, we can, yeah, there's, it's how we identify those peer educators and how we, how we develop them through. So. We're fortunate enough that one of our, um, our acting chair is actually from the TAFE Institute um, and the head teacher of community services, so she utilises the students to get some practical interaction and it's worked very well for us as well. Yeah, and I think that's as well as uh, how volunteers can help us, it's, as Tony's saying, very much about what volunteers can get out of the role as well. Yeah. They often don't come thinking that, yeah. um, and so it's our, our job to help them um, yeah. be supported in that. It really is marrying up those mutual benefits, um, and they do. Uh, and there are three phases to a volunteer: the training stage, the retention stage, and then the rec recognition stage. And as as managers, you know, coordinators of those environments, um, it's how we, I suppose, I'll use the word manipulate, but it's how we manage those processes. Because um, I guess as as coordinators, you don't want to always be on the front foot, always recruiting all the time. You know, because it takes too much work away from what you want to do. So it's how we move into, into that second and, and subsequently the third phase to keep those guys and keep those ambassadors. Uh, and I, I, it's a little bit because I think um, um, our evidence is suggesting that uh, 30 to 40 percent of people who volunteer move back into the workforce within a very short period of time, and they move into that area that obviously they've picked up those skills and enhanced those skills. Whether it be to supplement, as you said, to supplement either some formal training, so they're picking up the, the knowledge and the experience to supplement a skill they've got or vice versa, but it, it's, it's how we then... And to, some, and, and to be fair, even if they do find employment, not everybody leaves, you know? Not every, it's not a subsequent process that... A, a good organisation, we find, that, that has volunteers who <coughs> volunteer with them and then gain employment, good organisations recognise and congratulate that, but then they offer them another opportunity to remain within the organisation as well. So we never want to let... Forgive me, and, and this is my background, ne never want to let the door hit them on the way out we always want to keep it open because that's how we, we keep them engaged. And if they've been with you three, four months, three, four years, whatever, there's an element of loyalty there. There's an element of belonging. We never want to close that off simply because a person's found, you know, employment, which obviously is a great thing. Well, that's certainly true. Some CDATs I was working with, we'd had volunteers that have been with the CDAT from the beginning in 2001. So people have stuck around. So there's obviously something that people are passionate about with CDATs. 
I think also from what Tony's saying as well, I found a lot of people um, gain, a, gain a greater sense of confidence and well-being. Sometimes they, um, whether it's because they don't have the skills or whether they're just part of a, a supportive group and they feel like they're doing something that's worthwhile. Um, Tony's brought some posters around about the, the health benefits of um, volunteering and certainly if we're looking at primary prevention, there's, um, there's a lot of positives to volunteering in, in terms of your personal well-being and ultimately physical health because of that. So when you're thinking about engaging volunteers, there's a whole range of different things that um, Tony and I do as volunteer referral centres <coughs> to support organisations to really help volunteers become part of what they do. Um, it's really worth thinking about what do you actually need volunteers for? Um, how often do you need them? Um, some see that's only meet every couple of months, but they might do a big event. So you've really got to start thinking about how that and how you can communicate that. Also, what sort of work you don't want them to do. Sorry, yeah, Karen. No, I just want to know, do people ring you up and say they want to volunteer and then you find them somewhere? Is it, that'll be in a particular area. Absolutely. So we, um, from the Central Coast, we have 110 member organisations um, and they give us a certain amount of roles that they have. Um, we have uh, nearly 1,000 roles. 300 at any one time are, are vacant. And then we have uh, members of the community contact us and they say, I want to be work with children or animals or in aged care or there's something they'd like to do. They have these sort of skills, they have this availability and we help match them into a role. So that's why having a really um, descriptive role and being clear about how you can involve um, those volunteers is the first step really, isn't it? Yeah, sure. It's, it's and your regions, this area? Uh, yeah, we're the hunter. hunter. So... Um, there's the last slide, actually. Um, oh, okay. Tony and I are also um, on the executive of the uh, Volunteer Centre Network, which is a statewide network. There's over, um, well, we have over 26 members, mm -hmm. and there's actually nearly 30 different volunteer referral centres throughout the state. Um, we've got a little web link. You'll get the presentation mm -hmm. as well, okay. so there's a web Sorry. link there. No, no, no absolutely. Fun. It's very pertinent because um, there's, you know, there's some online ways of, you know, go, go volunteer, seek volunteer, which comes back to the the database that um, mm -hmm. we all use, so that will redirect you back to your local centre. But there's many different access points of volunteering, and sometimes that's what we're passionate yeah. about, is okay. that we can give that real hands-on support. Um, a lot of people say they don't know where to start um, volunteering, and a good place to start is at your local volunteer referral centre, mm -hmm. for both the organisations and the volunteers. So do you support organisations in the development of a volunteer programme and the roles and yeah. all that as well? Yeah, we do. Part of money. It's <laughs> um, never a question you ever want to ask me, but um, no. Uh, the, within the network, within those 27 VRCs across New South Wales, some do charge and some don't. Um, I'll be one of those that tell you I do charge, simply so because I think the work that we do is of value. You charge that? We do. Charge a membership fee. It's a membership fee. It's, a, it's you, like a registration fee. But gee, fees. you get a big bang for your buck. Well, that's important. It, it, it works out for us, Sam, right? It works out for us, or for our members, to be 41 cents a day. And we operate from the board to the coal face. So the and focus. And as part of that, you're eligible for training right. and a whole range of resources and stuff like that as well. So. It's an outsource for community based organisations. And I think, like any good outsource, um, it allows you to concentrate on what you do. And allows us, I think, to, from our point of view, refer you a better or a more suitable volunteer, as well as helping you with, as we're talking here about, anything right from writing role descriptions to policy procedures, entry and exit points, uh, governance, due diligence, all those types of things. We are, a, as much as we'd like to think we're a resource to the volunteer, we also the, are the same resource to a community-based organisation, from you know uh, the appropriate formwork with Centrelink to the appropriate policy procedure. Um, you know, uh, and even suggesting things like your 180 and 380 degree surveys, those sorts of things. And so, I mean, there's a whole range of um, legislation and, and um, the National Volunteering standard, stand, Standards that the Volunteering Australia put together in 2015 is a really good resource for that. We also have other tools, like mm -hmm. you say, templates and that sort of thing, why reinvent the wheel, and, um, and certainly take some of that um, bureaucracy out of being able to involve volunteers. We try and take the legwork away mm -hmm. for you. However, you do still have the responsibility to ensure your um, volunteers work in a safe and healthy environment, receive the, the appropriate training and orientation, know what they're doing and have right, the right tools for the job. Um, and also, I think with volunteers, there's a lot of um, goodwill and it's also encouraging a, a, an open communication so they can say they don't feel comfortable about doing something for whatever reason it might be. So that's another way of supporting mm. them to remain engaged. Can I ask you both, 
Mm. I've worked with volunteers and community groups and sporting groups, and it's common. You get someone who's in there for the wrong reason. They, they just want to do something, and it becomes like a little Hitler's empire. How do you... Well, I think that's well. Yes, I mean that's where so we I, I recommend a, a role description and a and you sign a code of conduct, a, a contract sort of thing. Initially, <laughs> initially. So um, some people do a three month um, yeah. probationary period, yeah. and that's an opportunity for you both to check in and say how are yeah. things going. We do a bit of um, conflict mediation and resolution as well, yeah. um, from the volunteer sake, but also from the organisation. And a lot of the time, it's actually getting the communication clear around what the expectations are and sometimes it's finding a different role within the same organisation and sometimes mm. as Tony and I do find another organisation for that person to be in they might be better suited to a different environment so I, I do take your point yeah. and yeah. I think if because if, if, it's all around goodwill if you if you go back to policies and procedures and you know it's all in black and white and it takes that emotion out of that stuff and it helps people understand a little bit well, better. I just went through a three day governance program right and I raise this at a sporting level, mm. the volunteer groups don't have a resource like you guys. Mm. And a lot of the volunteer groups are just clutching at anything that comes in because mm. no one's helping. I know. And that's, 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 a lot of, you know, that's an area where that I'd, I'd love to develop a bit more because yeah. I was part of the good sports program as well. Um, and recognising that, you know, um, whilst you, uh, sporting groups might need help finding a volunteer, it's the help supporting, managing them, coming up yeah. with any issues. And like I said, there's a lot of good policies and procedures out there. Why reinvent the wheel? And that's a, a good source that mm, we can mm. support you in as well. Yeah. So often see that sort of relying upon volunteers to uh, take on initiatives. Yep. Uh, so I'm sort of thinking the opposite way around. But if we had a concept um, similar to the peer education um, that was referred to earlier and was looking at perhaps a potential grant application for that, could we come to you and say, Volunteers to provide sort of human, human resources required to do that, and then proceed with um, the project in that fashion. Yeah. The, and I think that's a, a good approach. You identify. I think if you if you treat it like running a business, you know, identify where our gaps might be, how we and do we need to get that. And I think, as Fiona mm -hmm. said, identify what you need first, because sometimes you may not need the volunteer first. You might need the structure. For them to, to come into because you're quite, uh, otherwise it's that stitch in time sort of speak is that people come to all the right reasons and sometimes you can be so desperate look we'll just you know Thank you. and then at the end of the day you realize um shoot this may not have been you know a good outcome for either of us and in some cases they do that outcome isn't good for either of because the person comes in with one um, thought in mind and then as it transpires nobody knows how to address the subject Nobody knows how to address the subject of saying, look, I think I want to move on or I think you should move on. Mm -hmm. But it's then coming up with those strategies that allows the person to leave with grace. Right. Yeah. Because that's the big thing is always how do we... Because I think at that point of time, that keeps the, the honour and the morale and I think the reputation of the organisation in, in place because it's a bit like who's ever gone to a restaurant and, and enjoyed their time? Who's ever gone to a restaurant and never enjoyed their time? Who do you tell? You know, and, and, and that's the thing we, we would always say to an organisation is that it's how do we retain the reputation of goodwill and in some cases it's just providing that person with another alternative but it requires us to talk to them and, uh, and to some degree understand why the volunteer is there in the first place because sometimes if you have that orientation induction three month probation recruit it just provides you with those trigger points to talk that says, well, are they, you know, are they getting what they want out of the experience, but are you getting what you need out of the experience? Because um, I'm a country kid at heart, and I was told very quickly, the most precious commodity you'll ever give away is your time. And nobody rushes back to a waste of time. True. And speaking of time and grant applications, in-kind volunteering time is about $30 an hour, and for a professional, $70 an hour. So if you're asked for an in-kind contribution and you're having 10 volunteers, however many hours, it starts to really build up. And I think that's really a, another way of valuing volunteers <coughs> and letting the, you know, the, the funding bodies know how important volunteers are to what you do. Mm. So if we had a concept, you could let us know if it was feasible with your current existing volunteer group load or whether or not... Yeah. And, and particularly, I mean, we have new people coming through all the time, so basically we can help you go, these are sort of skills you can reasonably expect someone to have. 
or that most people will have. Mm. These are the sort of roles that people like to do. They, you know, these are the sort of hours that suit. So we can really help you build that role description and some of the procedures around it to, to get uh, the best um, opportunity of having people volunteering. Thank you. So as an extension of that uh, same question, to be clear, so if you have very uh, reduced capacity within your current CDAD, meaning you don't have a lot of active uh, members, and you're looking to uh, grant right, but you don't have the capacity, then you can use your services as an outsourcing for staff. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Um, we advise and support. We don't necessarily write the grant for you. No, I'm not no, saying but that. But, but we, can't absolutely, write, absolutely. we can't apply for a grant if we haven't got capacity yeah. to deliver it. That's right. And uh, delivery takes people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes, you, to be fair, that's when that virtual volunteering comment came in. You know, you don't always need a volunteer there all the time. That's a bit like IT. Um, I'll, I'll, gee, I nearly slipped. I nearly went back to my working days. <laughs> um, I, we have a habit of pimping volleys out, and I don't mean that, in an, but if I have an IT uh, person who designs websites, you can't always get a, you know, a, a, a long-term volunteering experience. So they work on a number of different websites for a number of different organisations, and sometimes um, uh, uh, application writers, they could be working, mm. but it's their, it's their opportunity. So what you'd find is that we'd find you a virtual volunteer, that would work, you know, look to, that work on that grant and then may go off and do something else. You know what I mean? Because you don't need a grant writer two or three Absolutely. days a week. And there are a whole range of niche skills like graphic design. There's a range of different things, and, and as Tony yeah. says, a lot more people are, are doing things. So they'll be connected to you, have a sense of what you do, and your organisation does. But they might be doing it from home. They might be, mm. or uh, sometimes you can, you know, volunteer in your lunch hour sort of thing. So they can just do it online. So there's lots of different ways, and I think that's where we love to challenge how people get yeah. involved in volunteering, and it's not just you know sitting on a reception desk or doing some weeding in yeah. the garden. It's, it's a whole range of different things that people. There's no do. such thing as a traditional volunteering role anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're fortunate we've got videographers who are do, doing videos. You know, journalists, photographers, IT. You know, right down to dog walkers to receptionists. Um, there's approximately 14,000 roles. We've got a couple of minutes left, so we're mm -hmm. just going on to the, the most So we're not short of opportunities, so therefore, and can I say quickly, in, in the new, there are 400,000 people in the Hunter that don't volunteer, right? So it's approximately slightly, of our 700,000, 235,000 people volunteer, so there's 400,000 who don't. They're the people that we're looking to recruit into the community from stories from ambassadors of the 200,000. So that's the marketplace in which we operate in. And I think, yeah, we're going to wrap up a little bit, but basically I think one of the biggest draw cards that CDATs have is how people can get involved in community, support their community, have a good sense of well-being, have a sense of purpose. I think everything you guys do is amazing. I know there's lots of different projects over the years, so I think I think that's one of the best ways that you can sell that. There is, I was going to do, one of the activities I was going to do, there's a um, something on the ADF website, and I can link it to this program. Basically, talking in your CDAT, what are the things that you enjoy about being in your seat out, what works, what are you inspired by, that sort of thing. That's what you want to be telling prospective volunteers. So that's why they want to come and be part of what you do. There's other ways of recognising, mm. formal and informal. Um, a, a genuine thank you never goes amiss. Um, and then there's the formal awards, which are this whole range. Again, these are hyperlinks, so they'll be in the, um, the presentation. Um, and this one I'm going to try because I've not done a hyperlink on this one before. So these are the different volunteer centre networks. I'm not connected to the internet. But th that'll be a link that you can have as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's uh, nearly 30 volunteer referral centres all across um, mm. New South Wales. And I think that's time. Any last questions? Because no one's disappeared. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hope, hope you got something out of it. Thank you.